It's via telephone right now, however, is financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Marvelous, Phil, and yourself? Living the dream. All right, before we get into the money aspect of this, Russell Wilson signed with the I Steelers. Huh? I know it. You know, you broke that news <laughs> to me this morning. You were talking about it, and I knew it was a possibility, but it had already happened, and I didn't even know it. So when I got home, I was like, man, Rob sounds like that already happened. And so I, I went and looked it up, and I could be sold on that idea because I do think – that he's better than the quarterbacks that we have in the house. So, you know, if you really think about last season and while they weren't really a serious contender to win the Super Bowl, they were a winning team that made the playoffs and kind of put up a little bit of a fight against Buffalo. So if you can get a good quarterback, and the question is, is he still a good quarterback? But if you can get a better quarterback play, that's got to be a good thing. So we got a new offense coordinator. We can't complain about Matt Kennedy anymore. And now we've got Russell Wilson. Eventually, we're going to start, stop complaining about quarterbacks. Everything's yeah. in place. It should be a good season. Yeah, plus the fact with Wilson, uh, the Broncos are paying his salary for you. Yes, yes, they're getting cheap. So they've got a uh, – and it's still – you know, I think it's a deep quarterback room. Even with uh, Pickett and still on the roster, I think, is, is Mason Rudolph. But any of those guys, they've all got starting experience. And they've all won ball games. So if there's an injury, and I'm sure they'll say this is a competition between all two or three quarterbacks, but I think in reality we know that Russell Wilson's got two or three years remaining, and and so he he's most likely going to be the guy. And let Kenny Pickett sit back and learn and and kind of adjust to the NFL, and then we'll see what he's got. But it's a yeah, they get him extremely cheap while the Broncos are paying the salary. So I'll I'll take it. I think uh, Mason Rudolph's a free agent, so he's not technically on the roster, and it does. I would, don't think he will be back after the Russell Wilson signing. I wouldn't signing. either. Yeah, I wouldn't think so, but apparently he's not getting a lot of attention, so we'll see. Yeah, uh, Wilson uh, was benched in Denver last year. The, he had 26 touchdown passes, eight picks. Uh, the, it's it, fascinating. Part of this is: Do you remember in the movie Moneyball, and uh, Billy Bean, played by Brad Pitt? Is in the batting cage with David Justice, and they're talking. They're talking effectively about he wants David Justice to step up and be a leader more, and and Justice has a bit of an attitude. I think he's pretty much better than what's around him. And uh, Billy said uh, something to him, and he responds, "Well, you're paying me seven million dollars a year." And he said, "No, David, I'm not. The Yankees are paying you seven million a year to play against you. <laughs> That's what they think of you." And this this kind of kind of rings in that the Broncos are paying thirty eight million of his thirty nine million dollars he'll earn this year to, to not play yeah. to not to, you know to play yeah. against him so that that does make you think. Well, they yeah, and it's it's two teams that let him go now, so yeah. yes. there's something there. But twenty six, we would have taken twenty six touchdowns as a group, much less from one quarterback last year. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, where do the uh, Steelers uh, stand with the with the draft order? Because there's a lot of good collegiate quarterbacks coming in this year's draft. They'll be drafting too late to get one of them. Yeah, so that was my question. Yeah, they're twenty second or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, okay. so in that neighborhood. Hopefully, they get a big offensive lineman. That's what I like to see them get. Steelers went, they went ten and seven last year with no help from the offense. Their middle exactly. line, their linebackers were devastated by injury. They they lost their best defensive lineman and their best three safeties for several games. <laughs> how'd they go ten and seven? How how well, did they go ten and seven, the, Phil? That's the, the defense of Mike Tomlin. You know, everybody says, "Oh, well, well, he just has barely a winning record and they get bounced in the playoffs." But look what he's up against. You know, I mean, you've, you've got no offense. The worst offensive coordinator in the history of the NFL. I'm I'm convinced. Yeah, but he that. hired him and then kept uh, him around for three like, years. Well, he's a coach, though. I mean, they, that's that's on the Steelers for letting him do that. They, Omar Khan should be hiring and firing the coordinators, in my opinion. But the um, but at the end of the day, you go ten and seven with all these odds stacked against you. You have to give him credit. It's an, it's the environment that that the Pittsburgh Steelers live in. You know, it's a tough, hard nosed us against the world environment, and that's one thing that's translated from Chuck Knoll to Bill Cowher from Mike Tomlin is that environment. Defense first, we play hard-nosed football, and we'll, we'll win ugly, we don't care. And that's what they've done for decades. Now they just need to parlay that into playoff wins and get back to where they were before. 
to make all of us black and gold fans happy. Dylan, you had your headphones on. I, I just think the universe is back in balance now that the Steelers have one of the like the top three or so most unlikable quarterbacks in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> why is why is Russell Wilson unlikable? He's, he's just, so just corny. Yeah, he's a so corny. corny. He's, he's also kind of a diva from what I've heard about what what he yeah. kind of wants. He he always wants like special treatment and hotel kind of stuff on the road and you know things of that nature. The teammates don't seem to like him. Uh, he was he's one of these guys that like he he his public persona it's like he's running for president all the time. Yes. Kissing babies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so, I agree. But, but he's agree. he's again the Broncos are paying him thirty eight million this year to not play for them. And I think I read somewhere like the the entire amount of money they have to eat on this contract out Dylan is like eighty five million dollars. Yeah, I think by about forty million more than number two, it's the biggest dead cap hit in NFL history. I think the, the previous one was somewhere in the thirties. Think about think about how much someone has to not like you to pay you to eat effectively eighty something million dollars to get rid of you. Right? Yeah. But now he was extremely now, popular in Seattle. Seattle thought the world of him before he went to Denver. won a Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. They, well, they, but they cut him. You know, they did let him go they as did. well. But his play had and, fallen. And that's not to beat on him, but it, it yeah. yeah. And his play had fallen a little bit. So I, I agree with Dylan. He he is unlikable and he doesn't have a personality. You know, he Dylan had mentioned like an unlikable quarterback, but Roethlisberger became beloved in Pittsburgh after a little while because of Oh, don't 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 pay attention to Dylan. He's a Ravens fan. <laughs> I don't, and when I Ray don't, Lewis is your town hero, <laughs> when Ray Lewis is the guy that you brag about and love, you got no no room to complain about anybody else. Zero. No, Dylan. No zero. No comment. The great <laughs> obstructor. And then after he left, after Roethlisberger left, he become even more beloved because like, oh my gosh, look what we had, and and look what we've got now. But, you know, winning cures all. So if he comes in and they start off 4-1, and 5-1, and one, he's playing well, winning cures all, and he'll be beloved in Pittsburgh too. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. That, that's going to have to happen, though, for him to become, uh, become beloved, is to, to win a little bit. Well, that's the thing. People, you root for the shirt, and whoever performs in the shirt is your favorite yep. person, and if they're not in your shirt, they're not. So. The, the alternative is he loses a training camp battle, battle to Kenny Pickett, which it'll, it, well, that'll be funny either way in my mind. I just don't see that well, happening. I don't think so either. I don't. I don't either. But they're they're paying him backup money. So if it happens, then so be it. Yeah. Hey, let's Go talk. Steal. Let's talk money, Phil. Besides Russell Wilson's money, it. of which there is a lot. Uh, by the way, I, I heard a report this morning from one of the financial people that small cap stocks since October have actually outperformed the S and P. Once you got to the uh, the bottom of the market, there, the last they traced that back to, Phil. Small cap stocks. We don't talk about small cap stocks as much as we used to. I don't know, a couple of years ago, we used to bring up small caps all the time. And the, speaking of Russell Wilson, the Russell uh, 2000 index. Yes, and small caps are a part of our portfolio. So if you look at it, it's difficult to explain this to, to make some investors kind of get it because we want to compare your portfolio performance regardless of your asset allocation. We get that question quite often, you know, with a moderate or conservative investor how come the S my portfolio did better than the S&P, not as well as the S&P? And in large part is because you just don't have uh, large companies in your portfolio. It barely makes up 30%. You have some bonds, and then you have some the most volatile, and volatility can be a good thing, say that often, but the most one of the more volatile asset classes is small companies. And small companies had lagged, uh, S&P, Dow, NASDAQ, whichever one you want to choose, that had lagged. But of recently, they have done extremely well, and they do stand to be impacted more by the movement of interest rates, especially the technology small companies. Uh, they, they stand to be impacted on the, the interest rate movements more so than some of the large, larger companies. So that is one part of the uh, stock market that we have been waiting for full recovery. And I still don't know that we've gotten there with small and mid caps. I don't think we have. Where we'd gotten back to full recovery, we certainly haven't with the with its uh, less volatile cousin bonds. We certainly haven't gotten there with bonds yet. But small caps are a part, you know, small and mid uh, are a part of your portfolio, probably in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent of your invested assets. 
What are we waiting for this week from uh, those who could affect the market, Phil? Man, and I know everybody's going to roll their eyes, and it's like, can we talk about something else? But it's the CPI, and it's the alphabet soup of reports that's coming out, and tomorrow morning sets that off with CPI. I think last month was a great case study because it disappointed a little bit. That CPI report wasn't as good as what we had thought, but we were saved by artificial intelligence in particular, NVIDIA. We were saved by that, and it didn't have such a negative impact on the overall market. So if we put the the, the movement of interest rates or what the Federal Reserve is likely to do in the future into context, Remember back to December. December was an incredible month. It was an incredible month for bonds. It was an incredible month for large companies and small companies. You name it, it was a really good month. And that was all based off the perception that the Fed Reserve was going to cut rates six times in 2024. That's what the market had priced in. And shortly thereafter, in January and the CPI from last month, now we've reduced that down to three times. That's what we're pricing in or predicting is the market, I say we, but the markets are predicting three rate cuts in 2024. And it is data driven. He had uh, the drone power, Jay Powell, and his testimony with Congress last week had basically said the same thing that he says every month, every after every Fed meeting, that we're data driven. We're going to look at this and read the, the data and uh, and react off of that. And that's, again, wash, rinse, and repeat. We're going to start that again here in March with the CPI being the the, uh, the first report. And it gets the most attention because it is the first report. But tomorrow we're expecting it to be the same as what it was last month. And I anticipate that our markets will react off of it like it has in, in the past. Phil, the last week, we uh, uh, the job growth was higher than expected. Uh, unemployment was a little bit higher as well, ticked up to 3.9, but still below 4. And the salaries, uh, the in inflation of salaries had started leveling off more, not static, but leveling off. Uh, you put these three together. Uh, what do you see uh, in your crystal ball? Uh, it, it was a little bit softer jobs report, still hot, still a decent jobs report but it was a little bit softer uh, than what it had been in previous months. And that, in, in particular, I think that unemployment creeping up to 3.9, if you're one that wants interest rates to come down sooner rather than later, by and large, I think it was a good thing. Now, our market didn't react that way. And I was watching it because I thought it was really important. But uh, I was watching the markets, and when that jobs report came out, initially it took a jump, and then sometime around lunch, Everything fell apart, and I still never really found out why. We just blamed it on the jobs report. But if it were the jobs report, that would have happened prior to 12 o'clock or the last time I looked. And it didn't, but it was a little bit softer. Still strong, but a little bit softer. And I think that is momentum for the Federal Reserve to cut rates because it wasn't as strong as it was before. What about the salaries? Uh, the salary, the, the wages, and I hate I hate saying this, but it's true. The wages leveling out is a good thing for inflation. That is a precursor to inflation either leveling out or continuing to fall and because it supports consumers. The more we make, the more we're able to spend, the more discretionary spending that we'll have, and the more confident we'll be as an overall consumer. So salaries leveling out is another precursor to interest or um, inflation continuing to fall, which, of course, would lead the Federal Reserve to begin cutting rates. Martin, Phil, <clears throat> um, first of all, if I had to choose to get $38 million to get hit by a human freight train or $38 million not to get hit by a human freight train, I'd go with the not to get hit by the human freight train. It just seems like the wiser <laughs> choice. But that's just me. You're not a competitive athlete. <laughs> that is true. That is true. I'm a writer, and it just seems I've been paid not to write screenplays, but not that much. Um, I want to test your confidence in, in the economy. So if, if you've got the 35-year-old family of four good jobs and they found their, their dream $500,000 home and they can afford it, with a 5% three-year arm, but they really, it's really tight with a 7% 30. There's a lot of math here. Well, 7% 7 30-year mortgage, right? So is the three-year arm a good, adjustable rate mortgage? Is that a, a good bet, which means that the, the uh, 
the rates will stay steady or go down and keep it affordable, or is it a bad bet? Yes. Which? I would think it was a good bet. So if you look at, well, am I going to pay 7% or can I get a three- or a five-year arm? Now, ultimately, I would end up referring them to someone. We've got a couple mortgage lenders that we like to, to question and ask these questions as well because that's the business that they deal in. But initially, I would say, yes, go with that three- or five-year arm on anticipation that rates will drop within that time frame to enable you to refinance that loan and, and obtain a, a lower rate opposed to locking in. Now, make no mistake, even if you lock in, say, I'm going to lock in for 7% for 30 years, you can still refinance it, but it's going to put some pressure on you early on in those years, especially at 35 while you've got children you're probably trying to raise. If you're buying a $500,000 home, I'm assuming you've got children that you need to fit into them. So so that's an assumption that I'm making. But, yes, I would anticipate that rates would be lower within the next three years. We say the same thing when people are looking for safe havens for cash, you know, whether it's CDs or certificates here at Ameriprise. And, as you know, now we're looking at the longer-term rates. Even though they may be a little bit lower than the shorter-term rates, we're looking at the longer-term rates as a, a bit more attractive because of the anticipation that rates are going to come down. The economy will start to show more cracks in the future, which would and, and inflation would continue to come down which would enable the Federal Reserve to begin to cut rates. And, of course, that will flow through eventually to mortgage rates and CDs and such. So, yes, to answer your question, I would go with the three or the five year before I would lock in at 7%. Phil, we're very, uh, we're all aware that the market r runs in cycles. Uh, looking at the long-term cycle, where is our current market on either a bull market cycle or a, a bear market cycle? We're in a bull market, a fairly strong bull market that began in October of 22. And the 22 was an awful year, but it turned around in October of 22. And we've had our bumps and bruises along the way and probably a correction early, I think, probably in March of last year with the banking worries and the woes that we'd had from the bank out west uh, that, was, uh, that had to uh, – uh, get taken over and the FDIC and all the concerns that we had about small regional banks. I think we had a correction then, I think. Don't hold me to that. But we are in a in a bull cycle. The the thing about this cycle, though, is, and it, it's become more normal, is it's a skinny top. And what I mean by skinny top, it's just a handful of stocks that have drug us along, and those being, you know, whether it's uh, technology or or the, the, the MAG-7 that we talk about so often in NVIDIA this year. It's not a broad-based bull market. It's a skinny top. So what a lot of experts are looking for, you know, Rob had just mentioned the small caps, we're looking for that. You know, we're looking for the smaller companies uh, to confidently say that we're in a bull cycle with those. We're looking for financials and health care and energy and all those other sectors that we can't, across the board, we can't say that we're in a bull market with those. But overall, when we look at our indices, we're in a bull market. Phil, you brought up CD rates a moment ago. And when I was a younger man, now the longer you gave the bank your money, the better the interest rate they gave you. And it is just the opposite right now. Now it's the shorter yeah. amount of time span that you give the bank your money, the better you do with rates. Yes, it's a great observation. And the reason for that is those institutions also anticipate rates coming down. So if I'm going to give you a guaranteed rate of return and I anticipate rates are going to come down, I don't really want to lock you in for three years at 5% uh, when, when I think you're fairly confident that those rates won't be there and I'm going to be tied to that. And people are most likely not going to try to get out of them early, of, of course, because it's paying such a high rate of return. So you do see higher rates for shorter terms right now in most places because they would prefer that you get out of those sooner rather than later and, and participate in lower rate guaranteed returns that's, that's about to come. We don't, don't know when, but we know it's on the horizon. Phil, do you have a final question there, Billy? No, I was going to say we've talked about small caps. Do you see another sector that, may, that will be emerging in the next few months? Uh, the, of course, the small caps, and then you, and it's it's not a far uh, a huge stretch to say mid caps because they kind of swim in the same waters. Uh, mid caps are really popular because they have some of the the same the same characteristics of large companies, but also small companies as well. So oftentimes you will see a lot of people suggest mid sized companies 
because they're, they're a little bit less volatile than small caps, and they can also give you the same type of performance. But mid caps, and I would also like to look at you know, health care and, and uh, financials that haven't fully recovered yet. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today, sir? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Phil. Okay.